Well, welcome everybody. Today is a very uh, special session. We haven't had one in, a, in quite a bit of time, but we are kind of like getting into the stretch of the post Soviet Design Network Global Conference that was happening in Copenhagen uh, just a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think now. Um, one of the speakers that I had uh, the honor and privilege to meet in person was uh, Ho Hen, who's going to be with us today and is going to kind of like give us a bit of a, of a double click version of what the speech was during the uh, Copenhagen um, conference. If you have seen it, uh, it will be a bit different. If you have not seen it, you're going to see something really good. Um, so we're going to get going and go through our classic um, this. So as always, I want to thank our sponsors, Slalom, as well as Preco City, who have been sponsoring us for uh, several years now. So we're very grateful to have them to sponsor our service design um, activities. Very quickly, so we are um, November 8th, so it's going to be uh, the last stretch of the year. We've had a fantastic uh, three years. Uh, I think we have over 20 different sessions that are recorded. So if you haven't seen them, please go to the YouTube channel that is probably in the chat right now and check out all the past speakers and past themes that we have uh, brought you over the past couple of years. Um, I am Greg Lacoufi from Slalom, and we are also with us Brenda from Preco City and Christopher Robin from Capital One and Brenda from Gen Financial. We are going to be uh, taking care of the uh, moderation of the Q&A, for example, um, and going to make sure that you, um, your question are being passed on to Jochem towards the end of the uh, session. Uh, as I was saying, you can just check out the past speakers uh, on our YouTube channel. There's about 20 of them now. A uh, very wide range of topics from uh, UX research, mapping experiences, facilitation. So go ahead and take a look at what we have done the past couple of years, and uh, you're going to find some really interesting stuff. Um, as I was uh, mentioning earlier and when I was telling you, if you actually want to ask a specific question to Hohem, please go into the Zoom chat window. Uh, make it sure that you guys are always very engaged and very active and participating, which is wonderful. Uh, talking to each other, which is great, don't stop it. But if you actually have a specific question for Hohem, please let us know specifically that this is a question for him and we can definitely just keep it on the side um, and we'll be able to go back and ask him those questions in about 40 minutes or so. Um, today we're going to be talking about joint management, the evolution of mapping tools. Um, we have been trying to provide you some service design topics that go from the very tactical tools, blueprinting and things like that, all the way down to broader topics like design ethics and futurism. So today is a good one to look into uh, maybe what tools you're currently using, what tools are available to you out there, what you don't know about it, what it can do for you, uh, trying to provide you the best possible tools so you can actually have the best possible outcome as a service designer as we're starting to really evolve into a very mature practice, at least in North America. It's been already in, in, in Europe and Asia for some time, but in the US is getting quite a bit of steam. Uh, we want to make sure you have the best possible tool for the job. So um, as you probably all know, once upon a time, this was blueprinting and journey management. Um, so Robin and I, for example, worked very closely for quite some time. Uh, and we had this exact kind of a war room situation, right? We actually bring stakeholders, we actually put a post in the wall, cluster inside, and we turn into a blueprint. It was great. Um, it was it was a wonderful activity to, to do together, and eventually it ended up being a blueprint. Um, I personally have done some of those that were thirty you know thirty feet long, which is about what twenty meters long. Uh, it was great. It was a wonderful activity. It was very collaborative. You could bring people in. You could discuss things. You could actually let people know what was happening elsewhere. It was a wonderful way for us to kind of like blueprint uh, a line of business or service, um, and it was also a lot of paper. Um, but the good thing is that um, you had one owner, right? So me or Robin or Brenda, we actually had one person in charge of the blueprint or the journal map and was able to updating uh, and kind of like keep, keep track of the, of the more organic way of doing it. It is highly customizable. You can do anything you want with it. You can add streamline, you can just double click on some activities. You can do some zoom in, you can zoom out, you can do some different variation. You can do like happy path, not happy path. You can do anything you want, right? You have complete control of designer. You can do anything you want. Um, it is an engaging activity. As I was mentioning, you can bring in your room, your war room or your activity room uh, stakeholders. You can show them what's happening. You can ask them questions. You can kind of like challenge them, like what's happening here, what's not happening here. So it's a very engaging activity. It's obviously highly collaborative. You can actually have a lot of people coming. You can actually bring marketing folks. You can bring IT people. You can bring like, you know, uh, change management people. You can definitely have them kind of like asking more, more, more specifically what they're doing, how they're doing it, what tools they're using, what process they're doing. 
Um, the good thing is they can be very extensive. You can actually, after doing this for three, four, five weeks or more, you can have an extensive amount of data. Um, your research insights are all in the same place. You can actually see everything in one place. It's a wonderful uh, data density uh, tool. Versioning, you can definitely go from version one, version two to version 35. You know, I have personally done some version of the same blueprint that went on to the 30s uh, because obviously it's a very fluid and organic document. Um, it's a wonderful physical reference source. As I said, there's a war room, so you can actually have this as a reference on the wall. Um, it can be very big, it can be very uh, uh, complicated and sophisticated, but it's a good place for you to actually bring your people and your stakeholders and your users, kind of like show them what's happening and show them what's not happening and kind of discuss this on paper on the wall. It's also a single source of truth, right? So you actually have this one place when everybody can go and check it out, whether you are there or not. I've seen people from the marketing department actually just go there and kind of like take a look at it. It's kind of like, hmm, that's interesting. I had no idea this was happening four, five, six, seven blocks down the road, so to speak, uh, or post-purchase, for example. So it's a great place that you have all that. Those are the good things. The bad things are the exact same one, right? So you have one owner. So if somebody takes a vacation or is not coming or is sick, nothing is happening, right? So people are looking at the same blueprint on the wall for like a week, two weeks, three weeks. The bad thing is that it's customizable, right? You can do so much with it and it becomes a nightmare. People have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea to read it. Um, it is an engaging activity as long as you have people in the same room. So as soon as you start having like multiple offices, lines of businesses, different floors, then of course it becomes very difficult to actually, you have to literally fly people in into your office and just talk with them, which is, which is doable. Again, it's highly collaborative as long as you have people in the room. So as long as you start having like, you know, different lines of business in different states and different countries, it becomes very difficult to handle or, or you have to be taking pictures of your, of your print and, and send it to them by Slack. It's simply a nightmare. Another bad thing is the data density, right? It gets to a point where there is so much data, so much insight that it becomes impossible to read. Like we can read it because we have created it, but if you actually kind of socialize this with other people, you show them like a PDF version of that and just don't know what to do with that. It's like, I, I just don't know what to do with this thing. What is it? Um, versioning, that's another problem. So you end up having like version 35, 2.3.5. Um, you are the only one who can keep track of all this versioning and people kind of lose interest. Kind of like, wait, what changed since last week, right? So this one tiny thing change, is it worth reprinting a 30 foot banner for this one extra process, right? Um, another bad thing is that it is a physical reference source, right? Always referred to it like, no, it's, it's kind of like eye candy. People love it. They come, they come and just get glued to it. Um, but you can't really take it out. You can't really move it around. You can't really roll it up, put it in your suitcase and go to different outfits. Right? It's kind of hard to manage the physical truth. And the only thing is also the bad thing is that it's also a single source of truth. It's kind of hard to manage. It's kind of hard to democratize, kind of hard to socialize. It belongs in one room, one place, by one team. It's just really hard to share other than the outcome of that, which is a recommendation. So how can we work through this? So we can get the best of it and the worst of it can be about. 2020 showed up, the new normal, right? All the stuff we used to do in war rooms and printing and had this really good time having those really great banners printed that was like lovely to walk around and even have birthday celebrations around. It was so it was so exciting for some people to be around a blueprint. That stopped, right? So how do we move from the old ways to the new ways? Well, unless you have been, you know, hiding on a rock for the past three years, you probably have started to work with tools like Miro, Miro, Stormboard even Envision Freehand and many more, right? So we've all learned to use whiteboards, which is a great collaboration tool. It allows us to kind of like share ideas and share inside and have one person in charge of that, but also share with other people. You can make comments. It's actually very friendly for people to be able to gather some thoughts onto virtual paper. Uh, and it's worked out pretty well over the past three years. This is the first level. It's not so much of a journey. You can create a journey, but it's still pretty limited. The second level is actually the mapping tools, right? So we have things like Smaply, they do Castellans, but also Miro, PowerPoint, Sketch, Figma, Illustrator, and, there's a, and I've seen people doing journey maps in um, in Excel, which was interesting to look at, but you know, if you work for them, you work for them. At the end of the day, people are able to draw a journey map um, and be able to somehow share some of that or export those. And this actually worked out pretty well to map a basic a journal map or user journal. But things are getting more complicated, right? So this is actually fairly simple and there's a good job at like mapping a user journey. 
but there's the next level. The next level is the information system management, right? So if you have not seen Mark talk about Smaply two years ago, I welcome you to go check out a video on the YouTube channel. And he explained very, that was over two years ago now, and he walked us through Smaply, which is a wonderful tool. Um, and now there's a new tool called Daydo, um, and they probably have some very similar functionality. They probably have some different things, and we're going to ask Jorge today to kind of walk us through that. But those tools are amazing. Um, you can have them fairly easily. I think they do, for example, as like a free trial or limited version, you can actually get it for free and start working with your team. Um, but those are the next evolution of journey mapping because they actually handle all the bad things we just discussed about like data density and KPI and metrics and multiple user journeys and multiple collaboration tools. They handle all that. Those tools do exist. I need to be aware of it. I need to be able to eventually use them and give it a shot. Um, and they may actually just revolutionize the way you actually work in your journey mapping. So today we're going to talk to Jorhem. So welcome, Jorhem. We're going to have uh, him for about 45 minutes. We're going to grill him on everything that those new journey tools can do for you and can be incorporated into your own workflows. Welcome, Jorhem. Do you want to talk to us for a couple of minutes, introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and how you get to this uh, software business of helping Swiss designers to make <laughs> the world a better place? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Thanks for the wonderful intro and uh, and having me on. It's a pleasure. I mean, it was also nice meeting you at SDN in person. Um, I was on stage. That was uh, that was quite fun. So, hello, everyone. My name is Jochem. I'm from Amsterdam, and I've been in service design. Actually, started in UX for for over a decade now. And what we actually used to do uh, today, I, I run a software company called Deu, and I'll tell you a bit about that. But before. We actually started it. We were like a CX SWAT team and we went into large organizations like many of us work, Fortune 500 type of business and, and everyone was busy with the digital transformation or the agile transformation of sorts and probably familiar, but like we for completely forgot about the customer and bringing that perspective into the way that we operate and the way we do things. So we got hired to basically bring in design thinking, human-centered design, blueprints, journeys, all the tools of our trades to actually teach the teams to be able to manage uh, across the different departments and basically work cross-functional, managing the customer experience as one. And what we noticed was that by doing the work, which was a fairly successful um, consultancy business, we went from project to project. But when we look back to what we actually achieved, it was more like one-off because the team or the teams that we collaborated with, even though we were standing in these beautiful war rooms like the one Greg had where the insights were presented, even customers were present showing validated designs that they co-created with us. Like we did everything right. But then, you know, business as usual kicked in and Monday was back to the status quo, back to chasing the KPIs, back to working process or, you know, vertical center in the organizations. And one of the things that we learned was that journeys are a wonderful tool, but they do not really scale. And we thought if you can manage journeys the way you can manage products, because that's what you do phenomenally well with the digital or the agile way of working in your companies or the product teams that you have, whether they're feature teams or product teams, you have a process. There's rituals, there's an org chart, there's a way of working, there's tooling, there's everything. So we thought there might be some tools we could use for our agency to actually scale that business a little bit from Amsterdam to New York, where we had some customer. Um, and then we noticed that beyond like my role was called real time board back then. This was all pre COVID. And there were a lot of visualization tools. I think the ones that, that Greg showed, like mapping it out, diagramming, visualizing what the customer experience is like and how our business is organized around that. But beyond visualization, there wasn't much out there. So that's what led us to, with a small group of our engineers, we had a few that worked with us building solutions outside of the backlog as many of the experiments could not otherwise be built. We thought, let's build something ourselves. And that was the first, and I can show you like what that looked like later today, like the first version of day, we believe like a circular journey, like representing a relationship where you have like the intertwined of steps and how everything influenced each other. That was the first version we brought to to our team. And then not long after that, our customers, what we did with the consulting practice, started to say like, hey, that's cool. Can you actually bring that tool in, have some of our team members use it, 
run some projects and then do a few of them together. And that's the moment we thought, hey, this is cool. We have found a way to actually do this. Um, but to build a software company is probably different than running a consulting business. So that's when we, we started to think seriously about building a company around a product that allows service designers, UX designers, but also the leadership teams in our organizations, or maybe you are part of that leadership team, to, to have all the inputs to make the decisions and that you can create rituals around journey management so that you can actually do this at scale instead of one-off projects. So that's maybe the long-winded intro from going from a service designer to consulting to like building a product company that we're now you know, bringing a product to market across right. the world. Well, if you don't mind, let's just let's just dive in. Let's just go in and see what uh, what this can do for uh, designers all over the world and how they can make their life easier. Okay? Yeah, sure. All right. You want so me to like uh, give an intro, intro or? Yeah. So let's go ahead and let's, let's just start from the from the top. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question and feel free to demo and kind of like you know tell us what your tool, how is your tool answering those questions that we all have. So the first question I have for you is not very high. So. What, in your opinion, are the core differences between journey mapping and journey management, right? We hear, we hear like journey up, design up, journey management. So what are the biggest differences between having a map and managing the maps? Right. Yeah, I love that uh, question because that is exactly what is wrong with the maps today, I believe. is like we put the emphasis on the map. The map is not the territory. It's not the customer experience. It's just a tool to represent that. And if we put the map in the center of what we try to achieve and what we try to do, the outcome that we try to create would still be like a beautiful map or a better version or future state. And we want to move away from that. Journey is a great tool to bring in what the customer experience is like and then look at what we as a company are offering in terms of features, in terms of processes, in terms of the roles as company uh, employees we play to, to support that journey. So as a tool, it's great. But what you actually want to do and where people use it for is to be able to manage the customer experience as one. So to even change something as simple as an onboarding journey or maybe part of your service, you need to work cross-functionally. You need product teams to build new features. You need marketing to make sure that, you know, that, that stuff can get announced. And you need your sales team to be informed that there is new things coming or they maybe have opinions around that. So, by doing that cross-functionally, journeys are a great tool to do that. But what we're actually talking about and what we can show today is, is the process of going from insight to implementation across teams, across you know, a vertical organization where management has different priorities than people on, on their workflow. And this notion of journey management is actually a new philosophy of organizing your company around the customer journey. And most companies that we work with don't have like one journey, but like dozens and sometimes hundreds of these journeys to manage and to, to take care of. So how do you how do you convince your clients or the people that you come to you who are, you know, very often like very myopic, like I want a blueprint, I want a journey map, but they don't really they don't really care about anything else. They've been told to do one, they do one. So how do you somehow explain like no, hey, we can do a user journey map. It just it's one thing. It's one activity. It's not even deliverable, right? There is a kind of a danger of actually having I know you're very big into like the journey map is in the end game, or that's your thing. But a lot right. of people still think like that. They just feel like no, they actually have a journey map that takes them like five, six, seven, eight weeks to build. And it's very, it's very dense. How do you convince them that this is just the beginning of the journey map, right? How do you actually go from like a map to managing a suite of maps and other tools? Right. So the the, the basically the observation I have is that. There's all these different kinds of ways to think about the customer experience. And if you're right off from college going into a job and you're trained to use journeys and you know what a blueprint is, then obviously you have like that hammer, right? I'm going to make a blueprint. I'm going to make a journey and I'm doing the process right. But the whole idea, as you have some more experience and you grow your discipline and you become you know, more experienced as a designer in a company and you work with phenomenal teams and, and really understand like the dynamics of what it is like to manage the customer experience, you'll understand that you have many tools to get to an outcome. And then journeys might be useful, blueprints might be useful, but what you actually want to do is basically get the context of what the customer experience is in any given moment through the lens of a specific customer segment or persona that you actually want to influence 
that ties into your business goals. And then the question is like, should I use a journey? Do we already have insights around these journeys that we try to influence? Should I make a new one or not? And, and that is what I've seen, like mature organizations, mature teams, they've gone past those stages. They know like what journeys are, what blueprints are, how to actually create them and how to use them. But the biggest difference, Craig, and I'm, I'm curious what you think about it, where product management, for instance, has, you have your workflow tool or you manage your sprints or backlogs or roadmap, and then you have the actual product, like Zoom, right? You can tinker with it. If you have like the staging environment, you can test how this new feature feels. If you click around or tap around, you can really interact with it and understand what the customer experience is like. But especially in services organizations or businesses that have a service component to it, customer experience is far less tangible. So what you want to do, even in a simple journey, let's say it has a few steps, you want to understand what's going on, what you can measure, where you have the data and where you actually track events. But you also want to understand what's happening in the minds of the customer and what is happening behind the scenes when they interact with their friends, peers, or colleagues. So by recreating reality using journeys, and all these journeys need to be in some form of hierarchy, what I call the journey framework, so you can see the entire customer experience through that lens. But if you have that, now all of a sudden, you have what product managers also have, something to tinker with. You have the customer experience represented in a digital environment that you can start playing around like, hey, what does that impact? And how does that work? And where's the insight? And if I do this, does that influence that? So building out your journey framework using journeys is the next tier basically in this evolution that we see and if you have that in place you'll move away from mapping i mean if you're going to do a new journey you still need to map it out and understand it but it's far more like understanding what currently is happening and what you want to influence maybe there are some new steps or things you're going to remove like remove uh, some steps to reduce friction or you're going to make something that is a phenomenal experience 10x better by building a marketing campaign about that it's really about managing the, through the lens of journeys and by making it easy for other people to be with you on this <laughs> journey. So, so that's, that, that's a great segue to my next question, which is another pain point we actually talked about earlier, which is um, being able to go from like one team of designers kind of like spread the wealth and the knowledge, right? So from your experience working with the clients and building the tool that I'm sure you can, you can demo very quickly to actually start getting a taste of what it is, what is the best way to streamline cross-functional experience management within one interactive tool, right? So how do you get a bunch of people coming from different backgrounds, different knowledge, different expertise to go into this one place that is probably not familiar to them, right? I'm sure it's a design-friendly tool. Um, so what has been the best way to actually bring everybody to this one tool, right? We've, we've had struggled to bring everybody to Miro three years ago, and we're finally all in Miro. So how, how is the best way to get into a, a, a tool like Smapley or Detroit? And feel free to show us some interfaces we can we can understand how it actually works. All right. Let me just I, I'll pull it up if you uh, I I will cancel your presentation. So there there's two ways to 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 consider uh, that that tie into uh, the answer. The first one is the organizational aspects of it. Like, is your company already thinking in journeys? Um, are you able to organize around that? And it doesn't need to be that all journeys need to have teams supporting that end-to-end. -end. It can be like a few journeys where you actually are able to do this with, let's say, product, design, customer experience, some people from data, and maybe some people from customer support. I, I don't know, whatever that constellation is. So you need to have a few of those journeys that you say, like, together as a group, we can basically research, find insights, understand what we want to change, make the change, measure the impact and see if it worked. Like that will be like the definition of, of a journey that you can actually manage. And the question is how far can you stretch that? All journeys, just one, maybe a few. So that is, I think, the org design part of this. And then the tool comes in because we're a platform, right? We're a journey management platform and I'm going to pull it up in a sec to show you around. Um, we cannot dictate change. There needs to be like a motivation in the organization to do that. But the way I've seen companies that want to do this struggle in, let's say, Flatland, the maps and the visualization parts is that it's, it's really hard to manage. Like versions that came up earlier, you're, you're, yeah, this is 2022. You don't want to have like version one, future state, version 2.5, version three, and then everything not connected. I don't think that that is the way you want to do this. So 
that is when tools come in and uh, I, I'm just going to pull it up and you can ask me any question or, or guide me in any direction, right? This is not going to be like super straightforward demo maybe as, uh, as I normally would give if I have a team that wants to use our platform, but I'll just jump around a few places and, and just show you around. But the easiest way to think about it is like a journey hierarchy. So journeys, customer journeys, like all the way. This, this is data, by the way. So here we see a journey from you know left to right. You have some phases, you have some steps. I mean, I can easily organize this, drag this around. Basically a real-time collaborative interface where if we would now invite the whole group, we could all like mess up this journey pretty nicely. What, what you would expect from a modern collaboration tool. So you have the steps, you have the persona experience, and this is all like based on, let's say your qualitative insights. But if you have a journey, you might wanna define ownership. So here we have Martin, who's the owner of this journey, direct and responsible individual, just like a product manager is maybe responsible for part of the product. And I think this is the interesting part because if we look at a life cycle journey, you might think like, nah, no one can own that. So I like to think of making journeys small and manageable, whether that's the customer does that in one go, or I have an end-to-end -end team that can support this journey from the different disciplines. And then you can start to set that up. So here we'd have a journey hierarchy, which people love to build in data. It's really understanding like the customer life cycle set up in chapters, building it up with journeys as your building blocks. So I can show an example how you build this up, or I can take this example and talk you through some of this stuff. What, what would you like to see? Maybe we can ask the crowd, like, <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs yeah, down or well, something I think, like that. You know, show us the things that things like Miro cannot do, right? So you just show it very quickly. You can go and do the slider, and you can actually have the sentiment very easily. Um, you can actually just, you know, sort things out, you know, you can actually just prioritize things. So can I give us a bit of a, of a heads up of what this tool can do that other regular tools like Figma or Sketch or Miro just cannot do, right? Like kind of like really interactive, really intuitive, very easy um, for multiple people who come from different uh, spectrum you can actually get in it either as owner or contributors and kind of like start participating into uh, the, the actual journey management tool. Right. So I would say there's a few things that, that really stand out for making journey management possible. Um, and, and I'll start with the simple one where you see like, hey, there's in this case, we have two personas that are like the actors of this journey, right? And you can create these personas, but they travel. So they're the actors in any journey you want them to be the actor in. And then you show what the experience for each of them is like, whether it's individual or maybe like the aggregated experience for both of them. You can really look at different angles. But like I said, like this is just one journey. But if I look at the awareness state, like just to give you an example, this is like the customer lifecycle awareness purchase use really very simplistic. Uh, too simplistic if you ask me, but it's basically like a staged customer life cycle and you can create all these stages in, in data yourself and then look at what the experience for all these journeys is. So here I'm in the awareness stage. This is the journey I was just editing and I can drag it around and look at how it maps onto, you know, what I said here is the three stages, sub stages of the, I become aware of, I have a problem and I want to buy a mobile subscription. This would be like a telco example. Now, as you saw in that journey, we'd have the experience from the different personas laid out in steps and phases. So I'm actually mapping these different phases in the journey to more like the, the framework. And it pulls up the experience data from all these journeys below. So here I would see like different lanes, which could be uh, geography based. So maybe this is like EU and this is US. It's a demo environment, right? Just making that up. But that structure, by the way, is something that really speaks to how you organize yourself as a business, but maybe we can go into that later. But we pull up the experience data and then you would see what the experience is like, but you can then drill it down again and say, okay, let me look at different personas and, and look at it from the perspective of Open Avery or in this case, Skeptical Theo or Deal Seeker Matteo. Hey, he really likes our stuff. What's going on there? So by filtering that down or looking at journeys that Greg would own, in this case, we have only Jochen or Martin, we can actually make all these different questions or queries to what these experiences are like. So bringing the data from the journeys front and center into your hierarchy and 
organizing that any way that your business actually runs on journeys is what I really like about how we're doing this in Daedu so that you can have any team work on any journey, but there's like this governance idea of bringing a journey into a framework and say, hey, that journey that you created has been mapped and I'm not pulling this up from our database. Oh, let me add it to the framework. Now, I hear you think like, <laughs> it's going to be messy. Uh, only admins in, in data can do this. So we have like senior execs do this or some people on service design departments that say like, this is it. Now I'm going to lock it. This is what customer experience is like. And now we can work in these journeys to understand what we need to do. So that brings me to a second example of doing journey management the right way. Um, and I can show also some, some frameworks around how the thinking got to be, but from seeing the steps, understanding maybe like the, the blueprint layers, here's a simple way of showing the features we currently have supporting this journey. We're starting to build out the, the graph and basically say in this particular step for this journey, you would have, let's say, a feature for cashback. Now, this is what we call an entity, a solution entity. It's an existing solution. We have an owner, and we know that if something changes, Charles, in this case, will know what will change. But we also know what other steps in different journeys or blueprints this particular solution will touch. So now this is a big one, but it can also be like a process in your CRM. It can also be something like a front stage action that you use as a solution and connect it to the different steps that in the customer experience, the user or the customer experiences that. So data helps you to build that up. But the most powerful way to understand it, I think is, is through lens of opportunities. Um, and they, they basically map on what we in the double diamond, triple diamond would say the problem statement. So this is like a customer centric opportunity um, where we say, hey, okay, there's, there's this idea of reducing the amount of deals I can choose from, choosing a mobile subscription. And we have some value scoring done, business and the customer value. If we solve this, this is categorized as a delight, basically giving the properties and the insights around this opportunity, what this is. Now, for each journey, you would have the context step-by-step, step. but you might also want to know, and that's, that's what Data helps teams to do, is bring all these opportunities in, in one place and look at like, okay, I'm a customer and, and a business value access. What are the opportunities that are most important and what is the impact? So relative size, how many journeys this impact? Oh, then this one jumps up. But you do that on one journey level, that's great. You can still do that in the mapping tools. But if you wanna manage this, you need to understand like, hey, what are all my journeys in the particular stage of the life cycle? You can go all the way to the customer life cycle. And then you can ask the square again, like what are all these opportunities from all these different journeys? And then what should we prioritize? And I haven't even talked about you know, running projects around this and then building solutions, but those are the two main differences where we see mapping is great for visualization, but this allows you to service opportunities, prioritize them, slice and dice them in any way. I mean, you can look at all the opportunities in, in, in the entire customer experience that are in concept and, uh, you know, Martin or Jochem or Alexis in this case owns, or we have, you know, that are part of the delight. So you can really understand from all these different angles, what would be important to address my business goals when I want to focus on the opportunities we already know in the customer experience. So those are a few of the things that we can say is different. Does yeah. that make, uh, make sense, Rep? Yeah, yeah. Um, Hohem, what is the um, what is the learning curve like? Right now, it's obviously amazing because it's already been it's already being created by somebody else. No, I don't know how how much work it is, but like if you have a decent knowledge of Miro, if you have a decent knowledge of Sketch, uh, assuming the average service designer has a different you know has, has worked in Jira, for example, or some kind of like you know agile tool, what is the learning curve to learn the tool, and how long does it take to actually get to a place where the tool is um, starting to give outcomes? It absolutely depends on what you define as, as outcome. Like this is a nice the design system where everything is in and we haven't even talked about the data, right? Bringing that in. But even if you want to start doing this the right way, what I see organizations do successfully is think about 
that that framework and usually there's like a life cycle journey or there's like a big thing around like the the value streams in your organization how that comes together so that will be like the top of the framework and and the easiest way to do is like okay let's create a new framework and say that's the life cycle so that's a little learning curve but for most of us today like that will be a no-brainer to set that up like i'm a customer and then build up stage by stage in the life cycle some of these what we call boards and then in each of these boards where you saw me create that like get triggered you would add then the journeys now that's where you need to start like because they have probably some journeys that you want to bring in or you want to start a new one so i'll create a sdn dallas journey and we obviously have some some templates to start but let me just do no template created the journey and if i'm not in the journey this is where you know you can really lay out like all the the architecture for in this case if you want to have a blueprint you're going to add like solution lanes for each of the different front and backstage so as you can see it's pretty easy to set up a working model but what i then see teams do successfully is you know the initial builders are always service designers or they're always ux designers or they're people that that, that know what they're doing so let's say this is this is great this is the structure we want to have it's fantastic now you can make sure that everyone else in the SDN Dallas uh, organization can use this as a template, right? So then we bring in this, save it as a template, call it the SDN Dallas. So, so I guess the, the next question I have for you, Hoheim, is like, how do you manage the journey's ownership? Like you or me actually owning, there's still going to be a, an original owner, right? As well as democratize the access to the journey's inside, right? So how is the service design team creating this? And then after that, sharing, right? We talked about having in the past, having to do a PDF and exporting. So how do you actually manage the ownership? Who can do what in the tool and who can only have access to the inside to not break stuff, right? So basically, how do you manage that experience? Because this is new to a lot of people, right? Before you've been, you've been invited to Miro and you kind of like, you can put a comment or whatnot, but this right. is very thorough and it's very extensive. So how do you manage that? So this, this is the question, right? And we're not done yet with developing the platform. So, but this is where we want to go. So journey management is ma managing these, these entities. I, I saw a comment in the chat from Danika. She was like, this is, this is very modular. This looks like Notion. And that's exactly what it is. So journeys are building blocks, like the onboarding experience, or let's say identification. You're a big bank, right? Uh, Christopher, big bank. You have online identification and people need to like, you know, sign in and make sure that they are who they are. That's one journey, but you use that in mortgages. You use that in personal loans. You use that in just opening a bank account. So from the bank's perspective, that journey exists once. You want to manage it once. You want to create it once. You have an owner that is responsible for it, but it influences customer experience in all these different parts. So having that as a building block is, is one way to make it easy. And you don't need to recreate that identification for all the journeys and all the work that you do. So again, if it's if it's not luck, you can bring that online identification journey in as many times as you want. That's really the modularity of that. Now, the organizational aspects around ownership will also make it decisive how you run this as a business. We believe at Deu that this should be accessible to everyone in the organization, but you don't want to have everyone to mess about with it. So we have some you know rights, obviously from admins to contributor to viewer. Everyone can, can put their comments in, but we want the admins to make sure they can put the structure and the taxonomy of how everything is configured in place. Then you would have the users, they can create journeys, edit journeys, working journeys in a given workspace. They have access because there's many workspaces that you can create. And you would have like viewers that can you know add their comments and be like sharing their thoughts and be able to view everything because then you can click from you know your life cycle all the way to any journey just jump straight in look at what's going on but not be able to to edit that and i think that's the marketizing the design part of it which is really important but by making it accessible we can also say like what is the let's say management information that we need to have if i'm saying now just as an example we have this okr that uh, we're building that can be like a subset of opportunities that we know are going to influence that specific goal, objective, or strategic priority in our organization. And by doing that, 
you can really make it simple for people to access that. Like, what's the status? What are we doing for the reduced pricey bill shock? What are the solutions that people are working on? Is it actually in Jira? No, we should actually create, um, in this case, an epic around that that we're going to push to the platform project and then the product team can take it on. But once it goes live, everyone involved, all the way to the journey owner or the journey manager, will get notified and knows that, hey, something changed, I need to pay attention. And that is what we build into the platform, making it easy. And now thinking of the Notion example, or Airtable, we're just getting started of making those boards, those workflows, those progresses possible on top of journeys. But the first part we cracked, and I think we, we cracked it quite nicely, is bringing that journey framework in place and having that opportunity workflow. So you mentioned organizational uh, structure a couple of times. Um, recently, um, there have been a switch of a lot of companies switching from like, being product centric to customer centric, and to literally reorganize the company around journeys, right? So they actually have, you know, uh, Robin and I we actually work together on um, a bank in the U.S. that actually has decided to kind of reorganize entirely around life events, right? It's no longer, you know, it's a very different approach. How would you recommend that um, they use this tool and actually organize teams around the tool? So basically, this tool that you're showing now, like either Smedley or they do, become crucial to actually organize a team around um, if a company has chosen to actually just have um, an expense-led organization. What is, what is your recommendation around building a team uh, around experiences and no longer products? Yeah, I love that. And I put one of the, the visuals I... I often use in, in front of us and I think you you nailed it by saying like we're starting up with the journey centric revolution I think that's that's the forester term right the journey centricity the journey centric revolution is coming product experience is just not going to cut it we want to do that customer experience so if we're going to organize around journeys we need to be damn right in having a vision on how all these journeys fit together but usually you don't want to start top down because then you're going to overthink it and it's going to be way too complex and we get like these beautiful blueprints that are all encompassing and not useful. So what I see organizations do, and I also had Kim Salazar um, in one of our webinars from the Nielsen Norman Group who's teaching this from a UX perspective and she also shares the same ideas. Maybe you can have her on one day. I think she will be a phenomenal guest in, in your show here. Um, and she says like, Start small, take three to four journeys where you really have the influence where you can implement end-to-end -end with one team, whether it's cross-functional or a team that is already like organized like that, to do this. And that is how you build it out. But what you need is from the top, a sponsor. Usually it's like the CXO or sometimes the CTO or CPO, the chief product officer that understand like if we want to manage the customer experience and differentiate our brand or business around that, I'm going to make sure that that strategy can be supported by the team building it. So you need some top-down support to get it done. And just to give you some of the examples of, of customers that we have that, that use Daydo without giving too many names. I mean, you can find nice logos on our website that we work with, but like one of the modern tech firms that is reorganizing around this has a portfolio of products and then services run across that. So their biggest... Um, idea is that journeys are the connectivity between how all these different features make the customer experience a seamless connection between all of it. And that is how they use internally the journey management. And that started up with saying, let's split it. We're organized in three different silos. We have three different product portfolios. So we're going to create three different workspaces and that's fine. We cannot do the change overnight. We're going to start the way we are organized. But what we want to do is bring the end-to-end -end journeys to life and breaking them down into parts that our customer actually is doing things. So let's say setting up accounts is one journey and then you know getting to organize my business and bringing in some of the data is another journey. That is what the customer does. So that's how they started to break down that you know, complex blueprint into manageable chunks and put owners against it. Say, you are responsible with your team for it. Uh, and there is a direct responsible individual that everyone can find, can connect with, who is actually basically re responsible for the 
improvements around that journey. Um, you just mentioned one thing that was actually the most interesting I saw in Copenhagen, and that'll be my last question before we open the floor, is that is data, right? So on a static uh, a paper version of a blueprint, you can have some data, but some of the things you showed in Copenhagen was interesting because you actually are able to add virtual and dynamic data to each of the key points, right? So a designer can actually go on an existing journey and they can like change the data, I can do KPI, I can do OKR. Can you show us very quickly how you are able to kind of like infuse that data that is hard to do in Mural, right? So can you just very quickly show us that and then we'll open the floor to a lot of questions. But I think this is, a, this is a crucial element for us since we're measuring everything. Sometimes it's hard to just measure and to share those insights with the shareholders. Yeah. Yeah, and this is this is one other beast of a problem that, that we need to tackle. And it also ties into how you can actually do this efficiently in your organization because chances are there's like already a decision that MPS is the one metric that matters to all of us, right? Around customer experience. And the business is organized around that bonus, compensation, you know, promotions, everyone benefits if MPS goes up. So easy. Let's use that rather than fight it. I mean, we have all have opinions about MPS. So what you want to do and what I see organizations do successfully is not look at MPS as one big like filterable database, but really understand if my customer lifestyle was broken down into all these journeys, how do I actually measure not only MPS for a given journey, let's say checkout and purchase is easy, but also understand how many people go through that journey, what does success like, and how can I measure that? But let me start with, with MPS because that's usually what you measure already on a journey level. So that will be, okay, so back to Dato. Let's go to a journey. I'm going to remove this one and prepare it. But let's say there is already a connection with your favorite MPS provider, um, whether it's Qualtrics, Medallia, or any of the other beautiful CX platforms that you use. Uh, and we'll, we'll integrate one by one, right? We're just getting started. But on a journey level, that's where we are. You want to add that, right? And I prepared like a, an MPS metric already. So I'll quickly add it. But what you actually see is that, okay, now we have MPS connected on a journey level. And that MPS has, a, in this case, manual source because I'm demoing, but can also be like, we're going to bring that from Qualtrics or whatever tool you have. It's MPS, even have a target, I'm going to have it over 40. And this is the evolution of the MPS. So we're going to bring the top line of MPS, not like all the queries behind it and all the insights behind it, but you just want to understand, hey, what is MPS for this journey? The context actually sits in the journey itself. So that is, that is one way of doing it. But the other way of doing it is thinking, okay, so on this particular step, what are the other data that is important besides the insights? Um, and here you would have like, okay, I have some questions when people start to figure out the mobile subscription, there's some metrics lane. And then, you know, you want to know how many people start a chat in a given month. It's another data point. So what you want to bring in is what you already measure on a step level, on a journey level, into your journey management. And that is what you actually see me do here. And I can like create these custom metrics and bring in really basically anything that you want or from different sources like Qualtrics in this case or later Google Analytics and bringing in your event data or transactional data into your journeys. Now, once you have that tool up, again, you can do this interesting things on, on a level up, say from all these different journeys, show me uh, journeys that have an MPS, you know, that is not that good in the last 90 days that has changed. Oh, here we go. Uh, not many journeys show up, oh, it's a bad filter, but you can ask these questions, like where does MPS drop the most? Where should we actually focus on? What do the journeys that we are building up actually need from us? And then what are then the opportunities that we see? So really bringing in qualitative and quantitative together. So you have a system of record that brings all these data points together because even a single journey um, alignment in most organizations looks, looks a bit like this, right? Uh, how are we going to get in sync about what the data says, what the customers say, what the priorities are, what the business wants, what, what I want as a person, where you know my priorities are. So bringing that in is part of organizational design, but I suggest work what you, with what you have. Don't be too you know strategic about measuring, just bring in the MPS on a journey level, that's fine. Then later on, what you have next, and you can have many of these 
top line metrics for your journeys. It's all up to, to decide for your organization what's relevant and how you want to do that. Does that answer it a bit before we open it up to everyone? Yeah, no, and I think it's great because no, because it's a collaborative tool, you can actually have, you know, giving access to BAs, for example, or you can actually go and work very hard on the metrics and the quant and add that to your the service designer journey, right? So now you actually have very collaborative workflow where the designer is designing, the researcher is researching, and the BA is actually gathering you know, data. And you can share with marketing. So if they don't want to use NPS, for example, they can actually have different metrics and import that. And it's a very flawless uh, uh, workflow where all those stories get pushed into Jira at the end. So even the dev team can actually be involved into like, oh, that's coming next month and have an awareness. So whether you're PM or an SO, um, you can definitely have access to this and we about like organizing the entire organization around the tool or at least the journey that manages the tool. We can actually have a team of like 20 people actually now working collaboratively around the journey and bring their own skill set into the tool, which is kind of aggregating that. So I, I think it's a wonderful addition to uh, the static way of looking at the world because like anyone can go and change the NPS and they can actually go and add new data. You're not necessarily like, you know, waiting for somebody somewhere in some building in some other state to kind of like send you information. So I think it's a wonderful job. So thank you so much, Jorhem. We have a bunch of questions. I want to be respectful of your time as well, because I know it's late in Europe. But uh, Brendan, do you have one first question for Jorhem? I do. Uh, Joe A. asked, when doing discovery research, how do you create journey maps for potential customers? Um, we had a bit of banter about that and some clarification in the chat. And and I'd like to think we got to the, the, the core of the question being, what are your strategies and methods for creating future state journey maps for startups where they don't have any customers yet? Nice. I love that. Um, let me first say that personally, I mean, people do this and they do all the time, but personally, I'm not really a fan of future state journeys. Um, why is that there are so many moving elements of it. I mean, you can do like a very simple map of like onboarding, like user signs in, creates an account, answers for questions, and, and it's done. Fine. That you can map out for a future state. That's perfect. But I'll give you the perspective of data. We have a land use expand model. So people land on a website when they're looking for a solution and they go into the product. We at that time don't know really much about it, right? We obviously have some data points that we collect and we know like, oh, you're this or that kind of company and you want to do this or that. But by doing things in data, we learn and we, we go. Uh, it's all part of the, the land stages. But if we wanted to redesign that particular journey all the way, then we would probably make 200 mistakes by figuring out you will go and do X, Y, Z. So instead, what we do is, you know, the first version of our product was, let's take a best educated guess, what the experience can be like and design it. Of course, we have professionals, we have, you know, people that use best practices and, and bring that to life. And then you start iterating. And what I find the beauty of journey management is rather than look at it from, let's say, your roadmap, what are the features we're going to experiment with? What are we going to try? With journey management, you can say, like, no, this is the actual journey. This is the experience people have. This is where the frustration is. This is the barrier where they don't do what we believe they should do. And why is that? That's where the opportunities are. And by thinking about future state, it would rather be what are the opportunities in the current state? that we as a business want to take on, that we have resources for to design. So the long story short would be for the very, very first stages of you don't have any customers, design the journey with your customers, be with them, invite them to your Figma or, or Miro board and, and design that with them, like what would, would that be? But once you have something up and running, you don't have customers, but maybe you have users, people trying it out, measure as much as you can, research as much as you can, record as much as you can, be with the customers while you ask them, like, hey, can you create this or do that or try to achieve that? And look where they struggle. And those are the insights you bring to your journeys so that your teams can use that to create opportunities for your bigger plans to see like, okay, what are we going to focus on? And that brings it to, to what we do at Daydo. I know we can do onboarding like, 20 times better for all the different personas we see. We have users, buyers, builders, senior executives, individual contributors, freelancers. And we currently offer like one onboarding flow, but it's a resource constraint. So we're deciding on one persona, do really well for her. 
and then move on to the next. So those are a few of the, the thoughts I can share. Great. Thank you, um, Robin, next question. Yeah, we had a question uh, earlier on from Victoria, uh, and I've heard this come up many times in discussion, um, sort of the crossover point between journey maps and service blueprints. And Victoria's question was a little more pointed on, you know, opportunities to align, you know, parts of your journey to the actual service mapping that you do. Um, and I'm curious about your thoughts on that. And then uh, Victoria also had a follow up question I'll do after you answer your thoughts. On sure. That. Now, you know, what I really like is that blueprints, the way I think about them should not be all these complex artifacts that no one wants to read, but they should be simple, but not simplistic. So if you have this, this journey, um, what you want to do is basically show below, if, if you really want to do this, like the way it's taught in, in, in design school or in, in industrial design, you want to have like your front stage. Maybe you want to split that up, but like, let's start there. So you want to build out these lanes, but I don't know if you saw that and understood that from, from day one in, in Daedu. These front stage solutions, as we call them, they can travel, right? So this is a front stage action. So if you start building up your blueprint like this, each of these can be little artifacts that you can connect across your blueprints, across your journeys. Like this particular front stage action probably happens in a bunch of journeys or blueprints if you look at your entire service architecture. And I think that is the smart way to think about your blueprints, whether maybe below this is a complex diagramming with data streams going all over the place. That maybe should sit in your favorite diagramming tool or process management tool. But that this front stage action is triggered by something the customer does is the relationship between the journey, in this case, choosing a mobile subscription, and the step, I have questions, to this front stage action. And by building this out, once you have you know, your opportunities linked to the steps as well, and you know these relationships, it really becomes easy to jump between journeys and blueprints to understand what the context is like. And if you have this opportunity you want to address, you also know, hey, I'm going to touch this front stage action that Brandon is responsible for. So maybe I should have a chat with him. That's awesome and very powerful. Um, Victoria's uh, follow-up question was around uh, versioning. I think there's more a direct question on capabilities within your tool or, or uh, you know, other tools that support that. Yeah. Um, so it also brings maybe back to the like future and current state. So we don't have versions. We don't believe in, in versions. Maybe we will have like history and time time machine at some point in time. But I don't know. Ask our engineers. They will not be happy to to take on such a beast of a project. <laughs> yeah. uh, just like Command Z, it's tricky to build in a real time collaborative interface with twenty people having all these entities. But anyway, the point of having versions um, might be pointless if you believe you have a reality to recreate being the customer experience through the lens of journeys. So you always want to be as accurate and actual as possible. And it's always evolving, right? Research is happening. Discovery work is done. Experiments get validated or invalidated. You want to bring that back to your journey. So everyone knows what's going on. That's one way of doing it. But if you really want to build out like versioning, and this would be another way of doing that, what I see UX researchers do, I don't know if this, this is related to what, what you do, is do interviews. And for each of the interviews with the customer, map out that journey that they describe. So what you end up with is having, let's say, five or six or maybe 10 journeys. And you throw them in, in data, obviously, in a board. And you can quickly, I'll show you quickly what that looks like. I don't know if this, this is just fun thing I saw. So this is my UX research board. Not a framework, just a board. And then there's like a research stages and then each of these journeys let's say i've done the mapping and i'm, I'm adding them will be represented one by one by one but if i start dragging them across these stages can reveal what the experience for interview we one versus two actually was I need to map out the phases to the stages and that would actually allow you to see hey this is actually what happened for this group of people maybe there were two groups group one and two bring those journeys together, and then start comparing them a little bit. So that is what we see a useful way of having versions of journeys, in this case, a research trajectory, but you can obviously say the same for future and current state comparisons if you are 
enjoying that way of working. So that's that's how I think about versions. So it's still like actual versions, but then different kinds of realities. Very cool. Um, I want to move to the next question, if you don't mind. Brenda, do you have a question next? Yes. Um, thank you for sharing the, your own constraints on your business while you're escalating. Um, the question is related to, to that. Like um, Sidant had the question of, where do you see growth or where do you see a growth opportunity to or for they do? So where we are going to go next as a company is a platform for service designers and, and UX designers. So I can answer it in, in splitting, recreating reality, making better tools to make sure that that customer experience framework, the journey framework is accurate, integrating not only your data sources, but also let's say your feedback systems that you have, your voice of customer programs to really make that data actual. So we have a partnership, for instance, with Qualtrics, where our journey framework will define how they measure things in their customer data platform. So you can actually have extensive analysis of, let's say, sentiment in a chat and automatically feed that to the journey step where the chat is triggered. So your research team or a design team or a product team has access to that instantly, rather than to need to dig into all these dashboards. So that is one way of thinking about where, where data goes. But the next thing that we are seeing is that there is so much knowledge between, let's say, an Atlassian and a Cisco and a local insurance company here in the Netherlands that have similar user patterns or patterns that they use to do journey management that may be not obvious at face value, but they create beautiful systems and beautiful ways of working and things in the company that really makes this possible. And we're making that exchange happen. Now it's like a closed community in, in Slack, but we want to bring that to the world. So what we will invest in is helping every one of us to make sure that whatever your way of working, your templates, your structures, your thinking can be accessible for everyone to use. So we as a, as a, like a, as a group of practitioners bring this to our companies because what I shared on, on SDN is also one of the reasons we were there is that Surface Design got the seat at the table on a strategic level today, which is great, but we don't yet have the organization around us to support this way of working, just like a product organization has that or a design organization has that. And I think it's time to change that. And we need each other to, to make that happen. And that is actually what I get most excited about is like build that platform and make sure that we can actually do this. Yeah, very cool. Um, I think we have a couple of more questions. Um, Brendan, what's the next question? Thank you, Jorge. The next, the yeah, no, appreciate everybody sticking around. So the next question comes from Austin Jackson, who asked, are you able to visualize journeys that loop back to previous steps rather than them all being linear? Yeah, so well, sequencing journeys and thinking in scenarios where like some journeys and here, start there, and are connected. Um, I don't think we've cracked that the right way. So we haven't brought a feature to the market to do that. The easy way you can do it right now is say like, hey, at this particular step, you link it back to another step. You can create step links. That's something you can do, like create a step link lane to, to make that happen. I think that's great. Uh, another way that you can think about it is choosing this mobile subscription. Back to the, I promised to show the original version of data and I'm not going to do that. This is a linear journey, right? But we started with the idea of journeys being circular. So this is like the same journey, phases around the clock and steps would be represented by these pins. This was the original version of data where, you know, you would have like a management summary of your customer experience and each of the steps in that journey would actually hold all the insights, like you see here, the experience, the features, and these steps would then be connected. So if you do something here, you would see something here. Today, most companies use this as a management summary of showing what the journey is like and then zooming in or out and allowing people to comment. But that is the, the way that you can do that. And in the, in the linear way, you can just create like these step links by using the linked entities lane, say step links and bring like, I have some questions and then people actually jump to a step in a journey from a different persona, let's say this journey to this step. It doesn't need to be this journey, it can also be another journey. 
and then we connect the dots. Bye bye. That's basically how we do it today. But it's not perfect, I would say. Cool. So, do you think in the future there'll be a way to visualize uh, something that that maybe loops back on itself? Yeah. So that is the, the one of the things in the like the the actualization of the customer experience that I'm excited about to figure out the sequencing, how actually people, maybe even from a data perspective, like if you have that event tracking plan, really synchronized, you can say today, 500 people started this journey and then you have this Sankey chart where 500, 499 went to this one and one went to that one and really understand what the connections are between journeys. Uh, that's the obvious one, but I'm sure we'll, as we develop solutions like this, come into more rabbit hole territory to, to figure this out the right way. So. Let's say in six months from now, we'll be there. So Jorge, one of the things we talked about earlier is kind of like the old ways, it was kind of nice to have a true holistic 360 view of the world, right? You had this map on the wall, everybody could look at it, you can see the, end -to, the true end-to-end -end surface to core journey. It was there for everybody to look at. Now in a tool like this, there is so much sophistication, so many lenses, so many filters, you are able to really drill down to what you're looking for. Are we missing that full holistic picture or is there a way for us to still retain that um, the high level picture of what the world looks like for the entire line of business? It is a good question. And it absolutely depends on who in the organization you are. Because what we see teams do and they do is, is two things, actually. The, the, the one thing that you saw me do already or have ready is like create a framework and break down all the chapters in your framework in different parts and then we aggregate the opportunity data from each of the journeys in there and you can look at oh what are the delightful opportunities in the awareness stage or the delightful opportunities in the purchase stage so but it's like very abstract this one the other way that we see teams do this is by making management journeys so in this case it was just a demo, but by typing in macro and micro journey or management journey and strategic journey, sometimes that's that's something that you see, or operational journey maps, project journey maps. By having that vertical taxonomy of high and detailed level, you can actually start to roll up things and you know use this as an abstract view and then use the opportunities to connect that detailed journey where there's like the different steps. And here you bring it only to the management journey. I think that is that is the early innings of what journey management is becoming. Um, if someone has practice for their organization and, and knows exactly how to have the bird's eye view and everything is connected, I would love to see it. But there are so many ways you can do it. Um, I think if we can build tools so you can create any constellation you want, that's 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 fantastic. So if anyone has has a fantastic solution for that, I would love to hear from you. I mean. Find me on LinkedIn, send me a DM, drop me a note. Really curious to learn. Yeah, if anyone has a question or a comment or a note for Jorge, we'd be more happy to pass it along. So just you know, reach out to any of us or to, to him directly and we'll be fine. I think we may have one time for one more question. Um, I lost track of who's having the next question. Sorry. Robin, is that you? I think it's me. Okay. I think, yeah, it's me. Okay. Uh, we had a question from uh, Rob, um, and I, I was expecting someone to comment about MPS. Uh, being the example that you shared for customer, uh, you know, promotion uh, metric in there. And Rob was really challenging or asking, uh, you know, rather than the the referral impact measurement, more of a quantifying new business received via referral from existing users or other, uh, I, I'm going to read into it and say other types of metrics that could show you uh, customer engagement and customer um, promotion. So the question is like, what I think is best or what, how does data work? Or is it more like philosophical? Like, what do I think about I, MPS? I'm wondering <laughs> if that is just happenstance in your demo, you used MPS uh, because it is a very familiar sample or are there other, can you, can you link other types of measurements or other proxies for that same kind of read? Yeah, so I think this is exactly the better way to think about it. MPS just being the metric that we know. You have a journey, you know, you want to know how many people start that journey. You know what the success metric for the journey is like maybe it should be effortless. So then, you know, effort score is a great way to gauge that. Or you want to have as many people through that journey because you're like in a theme park, right? You want to have people be there with you. So the amount of visitors on a day is important. It absolutely depends on 
the type of business you are and what I showcased connecting a metric to a journey that can be any metric. Like I said, we're building it out, making sure that you can connect basically any source behind it. And then you can say, hey, this is actually, uh, I don't know, an event track tracking metric that says um, uh, amount of people that start this journey. It's coming from Google Analytics. It is not uh, MPSC set. It's just another type. It's a number. Um, you can set that property. You want to have the, let's say, an average or a total. And then you can you know, add some more properties and start measuring that. So the example is MPS because it's most familiar. But I would like to see creative examples because nobody cares about MPS. It's really understanding what the journey does for the business, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I look at NPS as like salt in a recipe. <laughs> it's not the <laughs> core always add a bunch. Yes, you can always do better. I mean, you need it a bit, yeah, but you can also get it from other places. Yeah, so, but use what your organization has and start bringing that data into your journey management. That's, that's a way to do this successfully. Johan, thank you so much for your time. It was lovely to see you again. Um, you can access a free trial version of They Do if you go to your website. If you want to give the website address into the chat, it'd be great. Um, there are different levels of a subscription, um, and I'm sure you have enterprise level as well. So um, if you have any interest, you kind of like take a look at what They Do can do for you and your organization. Just do it. It's it's really, it's a next evolution, right? So if you're still doing stuff in Miro or Sketch, you're probably missing out on a lot of those features. And I know that Hohem went very fast. There's a ton of stuff that we can do. Uh, there's some demos on the site. Um, if you have any question for him, reach out to him directly. He's very approachable. So you know, keep in mind, he's like eight hours ahead of us. But uh, reach out to him on LinkedIn if you want. Uh, but it's a wonderful tool. You know, um, they do and Smartly are definitely the next evolution of the tools. It really is empowering us designers and service designers to actually do a better job and better communicating our insights. So uh, thank you very much for sharing your insight with us. It's a great tool. Uh, looking forward to, to train my team on this as well. Um, next week, we will have the wonderful Anne Deer, who was also in Copenhagen. Uh, we're gonna be doing like every week for the rest of the year. It's kind of unusual for us, but we have a lot of content to cover. And Anne will cover the um, forbidden topic of the unhappy path. Uh, she talked about killing services and how to kill services and why to kill services in Copenhagen, and we're going to talk about, you know, how do you look into uh, planning to uh, remove or sunset some functionality in your services and your products ahead of time as part of the MVP without jeopardizing the whole thing. So a wonderful topic next week as well. And I'm sure we'll be talking about user journey and management as well, as it is basically the core topic of what we do. Thank you so much again, Hohem. Have a good night. Thank you for spending your time with us. It's been lovely to see you again. And thank you for all of you who joined us from all over the world. Um, this will be available tonight or maybe tomorrow on YouTube. Uh, feel free to check it out again if you missed some stuff. And definitely go check out they do on their website and see what it can do for you. Thank you so much for everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It was amazing. Bye. 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 -bye.